2 Kings chapter 20. In those days was Hezekiah sick. Now this is a good king down in Judah. Good king, he got sick. He done right. He's been with the Lord. The Lord's been pleased with him. He got sick. What do you do with that one? On to death. So it's terminal. This sickness is going to kill him. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him. And we know Isaiah, he's, Isaiah's book, the book of Isaiah, there he is. Thus saith the Lord. All right, here's what God has to say. Set thy house in order. Get everything straight. Take care of unfinished business. For thou shalt die and not live. <laughs> what a great, I mean, God of healing, God of power. Isaiah, go tell the king, the right king, the proper king, king I'm pleased with, you're dying. Then he turned his face, this is Hezekiah, to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, well, look at his first reaction. He gets a letter from Assyria, the enemy. He takes that letter before God and spreads it before God. He gets a death throat, threat that his sickness, he's going to die. He turns to the wall and he goes right to God. That's proper. I beseech thee, Lord. I'm seeking you, Lord God. I'm seeking you. O Lord, remember how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. That's works that can never be a Christian. We have to walk in the righteousness in the merit of Jesus Christ, not our own selves. And what Hezekiah is saying is perfectly right according to the law. I can't say that. And have done that which is good in thy sight. Works, works, works. We are 710 years at least before the birth of Jesus Christ. Never mind the death, burial, and resurrection. And never mind the Jews rejecting and Paul calling out saying, I'm going to the Gentiles. It's works. It's the law. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass a four. That's the first time that shows up. Isaiah was going out of the middle court. Isaiah's walking out. That the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Turn again, turn around, and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. He's in charge. He goes out to battle just as much as the military does. He's in charge of the people and the military. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, so, is your God of the Jews, is your God the one that set Israel free from Egypt, is your God the God of David? Was he born of a virgin of the tribe of Judah? Got to be careful because Paul says there's another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. I have heard thy prayer. Isn't it great that God can hear us? Isn't it great that our God is not a piece of wood or a piece of stone that's deaf, dumb, and stupid? In this holy abode of God taking care of everything, feeding all his creation, hearing all the prayers of his people, hearing the prayers of not his people, and he reaches down to a little spot called Jerusalem into the bedchamber of the king. He says, I heard thee. I have seen thy tears. Look at that. Not only did he hear Hezekiah, he's seen the tears. Psalm says, thou hast put my tears in a bottle. Now, I don't know if that's an expression. I don't know. I believe David wrote that. I don't know if, if that's what God does. Imagine if God took, did actually put all of our tears and counted them. Some people would be in trouble if that's the case. Can you imagine if that's the case, and I don't know, and you can throw this in the garbage can if you want. But what if God held the tears of a spouse that has been rejected and tormented by the other spouse? What if the miseries and troubles of the world has caused one to cry? 
What if your medical conditions have called you to cry out in tears? What if God is, maybe not put it in the bottle, but he does record because look, 2 Kings 20, verse, verse 3. It is recorded, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. It is recorded that Hezekiah wept. God is recording what we do. All of us have a book that is written of us. My book would be Stiley Hayward. And it probably records date and time of things I do. And there's only one way for God to get the eraser out if I were to confess my sins. That would get the blood to wash that part out. And what if he's recording my tears? What if he's recording my thoughts? My heart? I've seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. Oh, look at that. That comes after he was sick. That comes after the, the death notice. That's the mercy of God. Isaiah did not throw a jacket on him. He did not pound him in the forehead. God says, you know what? I just, you know what? That guy has done right. That guy is really after my heart. I, I, I'm going to give him life. It's not always the case. God may say it's terminal, it's done, and it may be done. Sometimes God says, okay, I'll give you a little longer. I had one time where I was where I was drowning, and God gave me longer. And I thank God for that because had I died at that moment and drowned, I'd gone to heaven. But I wouldn't have as many as crowns or riches or pleasing the Lord as much then as I do today. Even then, I don't please the Lord. On the third day, thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord. Look at that. Three days, you're going to go to the temple. That's where Hezekiah always went. I will add unto thy days 15 years. Now remember those 15 years because that's going to come up later. When his son, the most wickedest king, will be on the throne. 55 years that guy reigns. You will find out that that son, Manasseh, is born during these, from the time that we're reading right now, within that 15 years. Manasseh is born. If God had not given Hezekiah life, and given them death, Manasseh would never have been born. I will deliver thee and this city out of thy out of the hand of the king of Assyria. So King Assyria is dead. Chapter 19, verse 37. His two sons have killed him in front of his God. <laughs> Sorry. But that hasn't stopped Assyria warring against Israel and Judah. I mean Israel, I mean Judah. I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. That oath that God laid upon David, look, it's still happening. David's been long dead. And when God wrote in the scripture saying, I will never leave thee, forsake thee, he's never going to leave thee or forsake you. By his own word. And Isaiah said, take a lump. That's the first time that word shows up. Take a lump of figs. And they took it and laid it on the boil. He had a boil. And he recovered. Now, I can go into properties of what figs, and, and it's true. I've had a boil, and I used the figs. And it worked. But let's leave off the figs, and let's just say God did it. Because if had not God given Hezekiah life, you can have all the figs you want, if God didn't say, I'm going to give you extra life, he would have died. We got to get off the things that can do it and rely on the God of the things. Remember, God created the figs. And all the medicines that, I'm going to say natural, I ain't going to talk about this messy chemical medicines they have today. But all the, the medical medicines, I would say, home remedies, where you take leaves, bark, and twigs, and... That's God. And remember Genesis 1? Remember the leaves, the dirt, the twigs, the bark, the, the cinnamon? All the stuff in the earth was made before God made man. 
So when you guys think about when somebody said, all right, grab some figs, make make something out of it, and put it on the boil. The figs were made before man was made. And the foreknowledge of God, he knew Adam was going to sin. He knew they are going to be, hey, not only are we going to give them figs to eat, but they're going to need figs for a healing property. They're going to need plant so they can make aspirin. They're going to need some kind of mold, and I don't understand all that, that realm, to have a penicillin. It's like when God made the heavens and earth, he had man in mind and his sin. The animals came before God, and God knew after Noah's ark. He's going to say, all right, you can eat those animals now. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what shall be the sign? Jews require a sign. Hey, Hezekiah, you're going to live. Okay, give me proof. Don't try that with your doctor today. We got your diagnosis. We can take care of it. Don't ask the doctor for a sign because he can't give you none. He doesn't even have the assurity. What shall be a sign that the Lord will heal me? And it's proper. He's Jewish. He's allowed to ask for the sign. And that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day. Now look, he believes exactly what Isaiah said. He believes exactly what God said. But show me proof. I'm a Jew. And Isaiah said, this sign shalt thou have of the Lord. That the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow, which would be sundial, go down 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? Here's your time travel. You want to go in the future? 10 degrees? Or do you want to go back 10 degrees? And what you see, it's either 40 or 20 minutes, this 10 degrees. I didn't realize that today so there's like four different uh, sundials. It, it relies on where you are on the earth and all different kinds of things. But it's either between 20 and 40, min 40 minutes. You can go back 40 minutes or you can go ahead 20 minutes, wh whichever number it is. And Hezekiah answered, it's a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. It's a light thing to go from 1 o'clock to 120, 140. That's... Happens every day. Look at that. Yeah, that happens every day. No, it don't. But nay, we got to make Hollywood. We got to make Hollywood movies. So nay, but let the shadow return back 10 degrees. How many time time zone movies, time machine movies are there? You know where they got that? They got that out of the Bible. And yet, notice no man goes into the future and no man goes into the past. Well, Hezekiah does, and Isaiah does, and all Israel does, and all the world will, because they're going to go back either 20 or 40 minutes. So, man traveling back into time has happened. 2 Kings chapter 20. Go back 10 degrees. Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord. And he, God, brought the shadow 10 degrees backward. I think they call that back in time. By which it had gone down in the dial, that's the first time that shows up, of Ahaz. So it's Ahaz's, and he was a king in Judah, it's Ahaz's sundial. A little bit old. And that dial we're going to look at also only shows up in Isaiah 38, 8, but we're going to look at that in a moment. And at that time, Baradak Baldum, the son of Baldum, king of Babylon, sent letters and presented unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. That's not all he heard. We're going to look at some scriptures here today. I'm going to read something. But Daniel chapter 1, verse 20. Daniel chapter 1, verse 20. Now this happened... About, I'm going to say approximately, we don't know, but 2 A.D., 1 A.D. It didn't happen at the birth of Jesus Christ. It happened when Jesus was about two years old, when a, men came from the east, following the star that moved. <laughs> and it wasn't a meteorite. 
In Daniel chapter 1, verse 20, let's read. And this multiple places. This is just one place I chose. First place it shows up. And all the matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times. Well, that's an interesting number. Where else do we see ten? <laughs> Look at scripture with scripture. Ten times better than all the magicians, okay, hocus pocus, and astronomers. So when we come back to Second Kings over here, when this time warp goes back 20 or 40 minutes, 10 degrees, Babylon's over there, they got their telescopes, they got their thing, and they're like, what the heck just happened here? What? What's going on, guys? The whole universe and the earth just went back. 10 degrees, and probably their sundials moved, and all their instruments. The Babylonians, amongst other people of wisdom and understanding, would look to the heavens, and not just for your daily horoscope, but they would know the times. That was their times. When those wise men followed the star, they knew it was time that that Messiah would be born. They were watching the skies. And it's probably maybe a fact is that those wise men came from Babylon area. Can't prove that. So here, time goes back 20 or 40 minutes. And it's quite interesting that the Babylonians show up. And they're stargazers long before NASA. Now, a couple more places, Isaiah 38.8. Let's go to Isaiah's book. We're talking about Isaiah. Isaiah 38. Here's a prophet, and he's going to write of what we just read. And Isaiah 38, well, uh, let's see, about verse 8, verse 7. <clears throat> and then we're going to look into another event in the Bible. Now I'm going to read you something. Isaiah 38. This is the same prophet. Isaiah 1.1 tells you, son of Amos. But verse 7. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which is gone down in the sundial of Ahaz. The time's already been spent. Ten degree backwards. We're going to go back. So the sun, so the sun, so the sun, the Babylonians are looking in the sky. The sun returned 10 degrees, by which degrees it was going down. Not just the sundial. The sun moved. That's what brought the Babylonians. Scripture with scripture. I got here the sundial circle is 360 degrees. The sundial is 180 degrees. It's half a circle. One hour would be between 15 degrees and 10 degrees, which would equal about 40 minutes. And the Jewish time, this is what we got to look at, is 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's day. But the sun moved. That's quite interesting. The sun the sun returned 10 degrees. But the earth moves. So when you open your newspaper and it says sunset, sunrise, it's the earth that moves. So when you say the sun, you're going out to the Bible. It never says the earth shall rise or earth. It's the sun. Now the sun returned. Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10. Something else happened a long time ago. And what time did was, time went back to where it was. Joshua chapter 10. And verse 13. Uh, we'll, we'll do verse 12. Joshua 10, 12. The earth and the people lost a period of time. 
2 Kings brings it back. 10.12, then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites. These are Amorites. These are Lot's children. Before the children of Israel, he said in the sight of Israel, Son, S-U-N, don't give me the joke about Joshua's children. We got enough fun play. Son, stand thou still upon Gideon, Gibeon. And thou moon in the valley of Echa. Looks like the sun and moon were up together. And the sun stood still. Isaiah said the sun moved. And the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon the enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? And we don't know where that book is, Jasher. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven. And hasten not to go down about a whole day. So it wasn't exactly a whole day. Remember, a whole day, a whole day to the Jewish people is 12 hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. But it said not a whole day. Now let me read you something. You gotta listen carefully. And some of this, it may be false Bible, but I'm going to read this as it is. It may sound unbelievable, but it seems that NASA's latest discoveries have brought about some new information regarding the Bible stories. Finally confirming that everything written in the Bible is actually true. Mr. Harold Hill, president of the Curtis Engine Company in Baltimore, Maryland, and a consultant in space program, relayed the following development. I think one of the most amazing things that God has for us today happened recently to our astronauts and spice, uh, sp uh, space scientists in Greenbelt, Maryland. They were checking the position of the sun, moon, and planets in, out in space, where they would be a hundred years and a thousand years from now. We have to know this so we don't send satellites up and they have to bump into something later on in their orbits. We have to lay out the orbit in terms of the life of the satellite and where the planets will be so the whole thing will not bog down. They ran a computer measurement back and forth over centuries and it came to a halt. The computer stopped and put up a red signal, which meant that there was something wrong, either in the info fed into it or with the results as compared to the standards. They called in the service department to check it out and they said it's perfect. The IBM head of operations said, what's wrong? Well, we have found that there is a day missing in space in lapsed time. They scratched their heads and, and uh, there was no answer. One religious fellow in the team said, you know, one time I was in Sunday school and they talked about the sun standing still. They didn't, they didn't believe him, but they didn't have any other answers. So they said, show us. So he got the Bible and went back to the book of Joshua, as we just read. And it said that the, the sun stood still. Well, they checked their computers and, and going back to the time it was written and found it was close, but not close enough. Then the last time that was missing back in Joshua's day was 23 hours and 20 minutes, not a whole day. Then they read that the Bible said about a day. These little words in the Bible are important, but they were too, still in trouble because if they cannot account 40 minutes, you'd be in trouble a thousand years from now. 40 minutes had to be found because it can be multiplied many times over in orbit. Well, the religious fellow also remembers somewhere in the Bible, he, the sun went backwards. The spaceman told him, yeah, the spaceman told him he was out of his mind, but then he got out the book. And they read through the 2 Kings 20 about Hezekiah. 10 degrees is exactly 40 minutes. It could be 20 minutes. 23 hours and 40 minutes in Joshua plus 40 minutes in 2 Kings makes the missing day in the universe. Isn't it amazing our God is, rub, is rubbing his noses in the truth? That's right. Many Christians are excited about this story. But others are asking, is it a really true? Such a question may sound lack of faith to some, but without rejecting the Bible accounts, an attempt to investigate the story is just as obedience as the apostle command. 
prove all things. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 And whatsoever things are true, Philippians 4.8. So you got to ask yourself, is this story true? William Waterbury, a, religious, a religion editor of the Washington, D.C. Evening Star, and an evangel and evangelical, yeah, I can't say it today, who was seeking to have creation taught in the public schools, wrote an article on the NASA computer story in his Washington Perspective column in August 8, 1970. He had contacted NASA's Golden Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. He was told that no one there knew of any such event having occurred. So many people have written NASA about the story that they printed up a special form letter to answer them. Will also contacted Harold Hill, that's the man we're talking about, in Baltimore. Hill sticks to a story which he claims to have good authority, but he says he cannot locate his documentation. Uh-oh. What they say about evolution. These facts by themselves cast something of a shadow on the story. But doubt increases when certain details of stories itself are examined. Mention is made a day missing in space in lapsed time, but nothing is said about how this day was discovered, except that a computer found it. But computers cannot do a calculation that humans cannot do, nor do they know anything that we don't. The real advantages are speed and accuracy. The story is Per, purely fictional. Computers do not have the ability to make such discovery, and every effort to contact scientists allegedly involved in result is either failure or denial. July 1989, Bible Science Newsletter carried an excellent article that debunks this, this farce. Also, the story dates back long before NASA was created. What if I told you it dates back to 1690? That is long before electricity, let alone computers. Then Harmony of Science and Scripture, published in 1936, Harold, I'm excuse me, Harry Rimmer recounts the following story. There is a book by Professor C. A. Tolton of Yale, written in 1690, which established the case beyond a shadow of a doubt. The condensed account of his book briefly summarized Professor Tolton wrote a fellow pr professor. A, a count, uh, accomplished astronomer who made the strange discovery that the Earth was 24 hours out of schedule. That is to say that there had been 24 hours lost of time. In discussing this point with his fellow professor, Tolton, challenged this man to investigate the question and the inspiration of the Bible. He said, you do not believe the Bible to be the Word of God, and I do. Now, here is a fine opportunity to prove whether the Bible is inspired. You begin to read at the very beginning and read as far as you need. See if the Bible cannot account for the missing time. The astronomer accepted the challenge and began to read. Sometime later, when the two men chanced to meet on campus, Professor Tolton asked his friend if he had proven the question to his satisfaction. His colleague replied, I believe I have definitely proved that the Bible is not the Word of God. In the 10th chapter of Joshua, I found the missing 24 hours accounted for. Then I went back and checked at my figures and found that at the time of Joshua, there were only 23 hours and 20 minutes lost. If the Bible made a mistake, a mistake of 40 years, it is not the book, the book of God. Professor Tom said, you are right, in part at least. But does the Bible say that the whole day was lost at the time of Joshua? So he looked and said, about the space of the whole day. The word about changed the whole situation. The astronomer took up his work reading again. He read on until he came to the 38th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. In this chapter, which we read, Isaiah has left us a thrilling story of King Hezekiah, who was sick unto death. In response to his prayer, God promised to add 15 more years of his life. To confirm the truth of his promise, God affirmed the sign. Go out in the court and look at the sundial of Ahaz. I will make the shadow on the sundial go back 10 degrees. Isaiah recounts the king look, and while he looked, the shadow turned back to degrees, by which the 10 degrees it had already gone down. This settles the case, for 10 degrees on the sundial is 40 minutes on the face of the clock. So accuracy of the Bible was established to satisfaction to the critic. 
Comparing this account with the NASA computer story, notice that both included the same three numbers. A whole day missing overall, 23 hours and 20 minutes lost the time of Joshua. 40 minutes at the time of Hezekiah, here too, we have a dramatic but rather different story of how skepticism is brought to see the truth in the scriptures. Does this story have any lesson for us Christians? I think so. We would all like to see skeptics turn to Christ and it sometimes a temptation for us to bend the truth a little to make a stronger argument. Uh, you never heard a preacher lie, have you? I've heard many preacher lie stories. After all, the end, eternal life for some justifies the means, a little lie. Does it not? No, it does not. This is trying to do God's work using Satan's tactics. In the long run, when God allows the truth to come to light, such lies only give unbelievers modem, explain, modem examples by which to claim that the Bible writers were guilty of the same things. Now, I read this only to tell you, when I first started studying the scriptures, I heard this story. And I believe what it was. But when you look at the facts, it's a big lie. Amazing what people will do in the pulpits to get attention by lying. It's right there. There's no need to explain it. I don't need scientists to tell me. Joshua tells me. Second Kings tells me. And Isaiah believes me. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Oh, I got to go to Tennessee to see the ark. God never told us to build an ark. God says, go in all the world and preach the gospel. How's that? And I would assume that something that when we all get the glory, maybe the Lord will all reveal it to us. We don't need to lie. Lying only hurts the truth. I just thought that was interesting to read. So if you ever hear that story of NASA and all that, remember that story came out long before NASA came out. Kind of hard.